uh, to one extra missionary that's with her, and that used to be uh, Eti, but Eti's finished missions now, so now it's a guy called Fu Ming. And um, the first time I got a message through, you know, sometimes in Facebook, you know, a message pops up, and one day I got a message and it said, I am fuming. And I, I thought, oh no, it's some angry person. They're angry about something at the church or something. But it was, it was Fu Ming messaging me to introduce himself to me because we, the church had started to support him. So he was saying, I am Fu Ming, not I'm fuming. And so that was good. I was very happy that the person wasn't angry at me. And uh, he just messaged me the other night and said about that village at Tamiang where they got the word. They didn't even know there was such a place, you know, and they're praying. And like Nime said, you know, they got this word Tamiang. They didn't even know what it was. And they found out it was this village where there's only the river where Moni would love to go camping, you know. And, um, <clears throat> and Moni likes to be in places like that. And, uh, you know, no toilet and everything. You just go in the bush and everything. <laughs> But he sent me this message and he said, oh, please pray for us. I could see that it seemed to me from the message that it was quite a big thing, you know, that he knew that he was going to this place. He's going to be there until sometime in January and they were just about to leave. So you can imagine uh, that he's going to this place where there's none of the comforts of city life at all. Um, and he's going to be there, stuck there for about two and something months. But it sounds like a huge harvest field when you listen what's happening there on that report. So praise God for that. It's a great privilege for this church to be able to support missions like that. And uh, when you look at the church, you think, how does the church do that? Well, I don't know. It must be just by the Lord <laughs> that we're able to do that. And I, but I'm very thankful that we're able to. Well, if, you go, if you've got a Bible, you can go to Matthew 6. Otherwise, I'm going to read to you. Lord, please help us with your word today, Lord. Please take it and, and let it sink in. Let it be real to us. Um, the people who weren't here last week, I just want to have a little cry and a stop for the people who are here, like, weren't here. Like, the message last week was a tremendous message. Is that true? Yeah. Amen. <laughs> I'm not trying to be arrogant or prideful or anything like that, but God just really spoke to me and showed me some good things last week. So uh, for the people last week, <laughs> sorry, sorry for you, but anyway, never mind. And uh, yeah, what do you do? So anyway, Matthew um, 6. <laughs> And, but I just couldn't help telling you that you missed out on something. <laughs> anyway, I'll stop rubbing that in there. Uh, Matthew 6 and verse 25, Jesus talking, and he says, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Don't people spend a lot of time worrying about these things? <laughs> Is not life more than food? and the body more than clothing. In fact, most people spend a lot of time worrying about these things, don't they? And Jesus is saying to do the exact opposite. He's saying, don't worry about these things at all. You know, people, it says, don't worry about your body. I mean, aren't people extremely preoccupied with their bodies nowadays? You look at some of the trends and things when you, when you turn on the television, if you, some people don't even watch it anymore, but if you do turn on the TV and you look at some of the trends and things happening in society, people are extremely preoccupied, extremely preoccupied with it says, uh, don't worry about what you eat or drink. We've got whole programs which are focused on, uh, you know, who can cook the best meal. And when it comes down to the last part of the program, this music comes on, very tense music. Who is going to go through to next week on My Kitchen Rules or whatever? And who is not going to make it? And, you know, we're very, very concerned about these things, aren't we? And people spend a lot of time worrying. And some people really struggling, you know. I, I, I see more people begging on the street than I ever saw before. And, uh, you know, so some people really worry about these things. But Jesus said, don't worry about them. Verse 26, look at the birds of the air. For they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than them? So this is a nice thing, isn't it? We're worth more than birds, amen. And he said he feeds the birds, makes sure they're fed and looked after. So he's saying, well, if they're fed and looked after, then we should be okay too, amen. He says, which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? That's a measurement in height, amen. So he's saying, if it, can you do anything by worrying? Will it achieve anything? Will it make you grow a bit taller? Will it do anything for you whatsoever? No, it won't achieve anything. Absolutely nothing. So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. So he begins to talk about Solomon who... You know, 
richest man in the world at his time, in his time, richest person in the world. And he said that even Solomon in all his glory wasn't arrayed. Like when you look at a beautiful, when you take a beautiful flower and he talks about the lilies and he said, even Solomon in all his beautiful clothing that he had and all his gold and all his silver and that wasn't as beautiful as just the simple beauty of a flower, amen. And so he talks about these things and he says, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven. So, you know, the grass just fades, doesn't it? It goes, some, we don't get rain for a while, it goes brown and dies. And it says, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So when he says, O you of little faith, he's just giving everybody that he's talking to a little rebuke and saying, you know, people are generally speaking of very little faith. They don't really believe God very big, amen. And so he's saying, you know, he's talking about this little faith and I think making a subtle suggestion that it's a bit better to have some bigger faith, amen, not just little tiny faith, amen. There are measures of faith. People don't always understand that. Verse 31, therefore do not worry. Did he not say that before? Yeah, Yeah, second time he says, do not worry. Saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? (laughs) You should see some people in my house (laughs) before they're going out. Oh, what shall I wear? I've heard this statement many times before. For after all, I just grabbed the nearest thing. I just grabbed this. I grabbed that. I couldn't be bothered ironing a shirt this week. Sometimes I get out of my shirts and iron them, but I just couldn't be bothered this week. So here I am in a T-shirt. But anyway, it says, after all these things, the Gentiles or the nations or the peoples, the generally speaking, the people seek these things. So he's saying all the people seek these things. They seek, what am I going to eat? You know, what's my, how am I going to eat next week? Where's my, what's my food money situation? And what am I, my clothes? And what about all my needs? It says all the nations are running after these things and seeking after these things. And he says, your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Of course he knows, amen. Verse 33, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. You know, that's one of the greatest verses in the Bible. Another verse that you should memorise. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all those things will be added to you. Amen? So seek God first. Don't worry about all the other stuff and everything too much. But don't, and Jesus says, do not worry. Amen. But seek God first and seek His kingdom and seek His righteousness. Amen. We want God's kingdom to prevail on earth. We want God's righteousness. You know, when you're right with God, then you can be at peace. Amen. When you come through Jesus to the Father and you know that God's forgiven you, then you're at peace. Amen. Hallelujah. So he's saying, seek that righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Hallelujah. You know, this is a simple recipe for prosperity in your life, to do well in your life. Amen. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and He'll take care of all the rest. Nimei and I have been doing it. I'm not trying to say this in a, in a prideful sort of way or anything, but we've been seeking to do that for about 26 years, I think it is. And God's always taken care of all the other stuff. In fact, He takes care of it really well. I found, man, when God provides for you, He really provides. But what most people do is they get it wrong. They're chasing after the stuff instead of chasing after God, amen, and putting God first. But if you put God first, He'll look after the stuff. Amen. It's just getting your priorities right. Verse 34, therefore, do not worry. Did he not say that twice before already? (laughs) Jesus says this three times in one passage, in one uh, bit of preaching that he's doing. He said, do not worry three times. He says, do not worry about tomorrow. How many people worry about tomorrow? Have you ever stayed awake at night sometimes worrying about something tomorrow? You know, playing something over in your head, thinking, oh, what? how's this going to be? What's going to happen? Worrying about the future, amen. He says, don't worry about the future, for tomorrow will worry about its own thing. So he's saying, just don't worry about it, amen. The future's going to be whatever it's, you know, whatever's going to happen is going to happen. No use you worrying about it, amen. And he says, tomorrow will worry about its own thing. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. So he's saying, look, you've got enough things to look after today. Why are you worrying about tomorrow for, Amen. And when it comes time to go to sleep, you know, when I go to sleep, I just go to sleep. I don't care what's going on. I don't care about somebody, you know, this happened or that happened or somebody told me something or something else or I heard some report of something, blah, 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 blah. I don't care. I just like to go to my bed. The most important piece of furniture in your house is what? 
your bed. Amen. And so I like to go to my bed and go to say, and Nime might be going on about something, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, no, please, I'm going to sleep now. You know. <laughs> the greatest gift that you can give to a woman is to listen to her. <clears throat> it's a very expensive gift. Amen. It's costs more than jewellery or anything like that. It's at great cost to a man. <laughs> anyway, I better, get in, no, I better not get into this. Yeah, I might get in, somebody might do something to me. So uh, <laughs> it's free, you're right. But it's very hard sometimes. <laughs> anyway, so for, let's go to Philippians 4. Now what did, in Philippians 4, we get to there. Now what did Jesus say three times? Do not worry. I mean, can you say that with me? Do not worry. Worry. Now we're going to say it to ourselves, amen, because Jesus said it to us. So say with me, do not worry. Now we're going to say it one more time to ourselves, okay? Do not worry, amen. You know, if only the world knew this, and if only even Christians just obeyed this, uh, there'd be so much less sickness, so much less problems. I reckon our hospitals would be about half empty, amen. All the... Um, things that have to be done for mental health in this country and everything, all the problems that people had, it would probably be halved. Amen? I believe personally, if people just did, obeyed that, just did that and just said to themselves, Jesus said, do not worry, so I won't worry. Amen? Just gave up worrying. So just say, I give up worrying. <laughs> Amen? Just give it up. Just quit it. Amen? Just resign from worrying, amen, from your position of worrying. <laughs> Just give that position up. Hallelujah. I tell you what, you know, that is one of these secrets. If there's one secret to being happy in life, it's to not worry about anything. Amen. Hallelujah. You know, we almost feel like we have a responsibility, don't we? It's like people tell you something and you feel, oh, I'm, I'm going to have to worry about this a bit. No, no, you don't, amen. You can care, it's, you can be compassionate, you can pray for people, all those sorts of things, but you don't have to worry, amen. Hallelujah. You know, people will come to you, people come to me sometimes with things to pray for that, my goodness, you know, sometimes people come and they're facing life or death. They come and they say, oh, I've got a diagnosis of cancer or something like this and everything. So, you know, uh, uh, the things that people tell me or that tell you sometimes, you could get so burdened with them, couldn't you? You could get so burdened and you could be so worried and everything and stuff. But the Bible says not to worry, amen. It says to pray, but not to worry. Amen. amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> okay, Philippians 4, uh, verse 6 says, be anxious for nothing. How many things do you get anxious about? Nothing. nothing at all, amen? But in everything, so he says, everything you should do this, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. What's he saying? He's saying, don't worry, don't be anxious about anything, but pray, pray, amen? What's the alternative to worry? is to pray, to pray about it. Amen? I learned that even with the church. You know, I found that if I try and get into all sorts of human effort and running around and trying to do things in my own human strength, it doesn't often do much good. But if I pray, if I pray, if something's going on and I pray, amen, or someone's struggling or something like that, I pray for them, amen? Prayer is like a remote control. Do you realise that? It's like, you know, when you use it, you know, when you get a, a, one of those remote control cars or something like that, and, you know, and you have the remote control and you go like this and the car goes all around like that. You can't touch that car. You can't reach that car. You know, you're not manipulating that car directly, physically, in any way whatsoever, are you? You just use your little remote control. You could be way over the other side of a car park or something, and there's that little remote control thing or those helicopters people have or the planes going around. It could be doing all this kind of stuff. You're not even touching it physically whatsoever. Geographically, it's removed from you, but you're having a direct effect on it. That is what prayer is like. You're able to reach out, reach across into another person's life and have an effect on their life because you go to the Father and represent them to the Father and pray for them in the name of Jesus, amen, and things happen for them. Hallelujah. Rather than us running and, oh, I've got to fix it myself. No, you're not the Saviour Jesus is, amen. 
Hallelujah. That's another thing. If only us Christians could learn that we are not the Saviour. Amen. None of, none of, we can't even save a flea. Amen. But Jesus is the Saviour. Amen. Of every human being. Hallelujah. Anyway, I hope that helps you. I hope that releases you from some stress and stuff like that. And it says, and the peace of God, amen, not human peace, but supernatural peace that comes from God, which surpasses all understanding, all human understanding. You can't understand it with your human mind. It's just supernatural peace. Will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. It will guard your mind. It will guard your heart. Hallelujah. So if you give up worrying and instead you pray, amen, and put the things to the Lord in prayer, then this supernatural peace will guard your mind and will guard your heart. Now, you probably learnt already in life that you really need a guard over your mind and you really need a guard over your heart because things go on there, amen? Things happen in your mind. And many of the struggles we have are in here, aren't they? Many of the struggles are in here, amen? in our inner being. Many of the struggles are going on in our inner being or in our mind, amen, in our spirit or in our mind. Hallelujah. So we need a guard over them. And that guard is the peace of God. And the peace of God comes through prayer, through praying. Hallelujah. Through putting it to the Lord in prayer, amen. Hallelujah. Amen. I know this is basic message today, but I just felt the Lord say to me, just talk about do not worry. So I just thought, okay, Lord, we'll do it. Amen? Hallelujah. Is it helpful? I think it's good. It's the Word of God. Then it says, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, this is Philippians 4.8, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are a good report, if there is any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Amen? Not on all the terrible things. I mean, there's lots of terrible things. I mean, yes, you, you, you read the news. I look at the news sometimes. I take note of things that are going on in the world and all that. I'm not trying to be like an ostrich, amen, and put my head in the sand or something and ignore the world. Yes, we know about all the things and we take note of things and we can pray about things and all that. But Jesus says, if you really want this peace and you don't want to be worried about things, then meditate on good things things. Meditate on good things. Amen. You know, meditation includes the use of, I know I've taught this before, but it's important to mention it again, and some people may not have heard it before, but meditation includes what you do with your spoken words, what you do with your mouth. If you look into the meaning of meditation in the Old Testament, it talks about not just what you think about, but what you speak about. What you talk about is part of your meditation. Amen. What you talk about is part of your meditation. So if you just talk a whole lot of stuff about stuff that is not good, amen, then you're meditating on all this not good stuff and then you will start to worry and get anxious and so on, amen. Yes, we need to communicate things, amen, all that kind of thing. But when you begin to just dwell on it and go over it and over it and over it, I mean, it's not going to do you any good. Because Paul said, meditate on good things, amen. So I have to, you know, in life we have to look at some of the bad things and we have to say, okay, yes, that's not so good. And I pray about that and ask the Lord to do something about it. But then you've got to move on in your own mind and your own heart, amen. And, then, and, and meditate on good things. Otherwise, you're just going to be an unhappy person and it's not going to serve anyone any use, amen. If you are a burden, overly burdened, unhappy person with all the weight of the world weighing you down, you're not going to do the world much good. Amen. Hallelujah. Jesus wants you happy and he wants you carefree. Do you think Jesus walked around like this when he was on earth? No. Jesus is like this. <laughs> Amen. Do you think he walked into the room and he's like, oh, those Pharisees, oh, and all these unbelieving people, oh, got to go to the cross. And, oh. I mean, I know he had a struggle just before the cross, and everything, but do you think he spent most of his time like that, all burdened down and weighed down? No, he was worry-free and carefree, amen? Do you think when he went to sleep, he went to sleep? Yeah. Remember in the storm? And they're in a storm and all of this water coming into the boat and the boat's going less and everything. What's Jesus doing? <laughs> Fast asleep, not a worry in the world. Amen? 
He knows the Father's got his back. The Father will take care of him. There's no worry. Even if the boat sinks, they can all walk on water. Amen. He's not worried about it in the least way. He remembers Jonah. You know, Jonah got thrown in the sea. Amen. And big whale comes along. And next thing, Jonah's inside the whale. And when you get inside a whale, you really start praying. And so Jonah started praying. Amen. And he learned the lesson about don't be anxious, but pray. Amen. <laughs> So Jesus thought, oh, we can eat, you know, who, who cares? Get thrown in the water, you get swallowed by a whale. Well, God will always come up with something, amen. amen. Hallelujah. Worry free, carefree, amen. <laughs> That's what Jesus is looking for. Hallelujah. That's what he wants. Okay, first, since you, just in case you're in any kind of doubt, we'll go to 1 Peter chapter 5. So we'll really hammer this. In so that you're absolutely not in doubt whatsoever. First Peter 5 and from verse 6 it says, Therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. You know, some people want to be exalted really quickly, amen. And the Bible says that promotion or exaltation doesn't come from the east or the west, but it comes from God. Amen. So it's no use really trying to promote yourself particularly. It's better to let God promote you, amen. And so, of course, some of us are probably too humble sometimes, but that's another matter. But anyway, it says, Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Casting all your care, all your cares, all your worries, what does he say to do? Cast it all onto Jesus, because he cares for you. Amen. So sometimes we just got to take it all, say, oh, these are my worries, these are my cares, and take it like this, and take it over to Jesus and say, here you are, Jesus. <laughs> I, I'm going to just let you take care of this. I prayed about it. I, I put it to the Lord. I intercede, whatever I needed to do. Amen. And then I'm taking it to the Lord. I'm going to put it to the Lord. Amen. You know, I tell you this stuff every day, isn't that just, I, I think, you know, I, I pretty much every day I'll hear something that could tempt me to worry. You know, hear something about a family member or hear something about a friend or hear something about someone in the church or hear something about someone else, amen? And I could be tempted to worry about it. But I've learned, don't worry. It's all right. God's in charge. He's got it under control. And just pray about it and say, well, Lord, you know, we pray for this and we pray for your will and your kingdom to come in this situation, Amen. And then put it over to the Lord. Because me or you worrying about it is not going to help anything. Amen? Not going to help anything. Hallelujah. He says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, lion seeking whom he may devour. So there is a devil out there. And it says he's like a roaring lion and, uh, and uh, he wants to... Devour people, amen, he wants to eat them. <laughs> and it says, verse 9, resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. So he's saying resist the devil, amen. Resist the devil. And James said, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. And before that, James told us, if you look in uh, James, I think it's chapter 4, James said, submit to God. It's exactly what uh, Peter is saying here. He says, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. Cast all your care over onto the Lord and then resist the devil. Amen. Some people have a lot of trouble with the devil because they don't do the first part. What's the first part? Submit to God. Humble yourself before the Lord. Then pray and hand all your worries and cares over to the Lord and then resist the devil. Some people are trying to resist the devil, but they're worried as anything. <laughs> they're carrying worries and they're carrying cares. And they're going, I resist you, I resist you, devil. But the devil knows they're carrying all this worry and all this care and they need to hand it over to the Lord. Amen. Because the Lord loves you. He cares about you. Amen. And you've got to have that revelation. And then when you go to resist the devil, you've got this revelation that God cares about me. He loves me. And I've handed all the burdens and all the cares over to him. Amen. Jesus is the great burden remover. Amen. He said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Didn't he? Hallelujah. And to come to him, all who are weary and tired, and he'll give us rest. Amen. 
And even Hebrews chapter 2 and 3 talks all about this rest, hallelujah, that you'll find in Jesus. The rest is in Jesus. In fact, the rest is Jesus. Amen. Anyway, that's probably a whole nother sermon we could preach on rest. But what I'm saying is you do those things and then you resist the devil and you won't have so much trouble with the devil. Amen. Hallelujah. I believe most people's problems with the devil is because of something where they're not doing the word right already in their own life. They're not really obeying God's word, amen, in some area. And that's why the devil gets an entry point. (laughs) Anyway, that's what I believe. Up to you what you think. Let's just have a look at something to really stir you up and give you a fright. Revelation chapter 21. Would you like to get a bit of a fright? Anyone here like watching movies where you get big frights? I quite like that. Some people don't like it, but I quite like it when you're watching the movie and then suddenly something goes, ah, like that, and somebody jumps out or something and gives you a big fright. I quite enjoy that. But Revelation, you know, the zombie jumps out. Revelation chapter 21 and verse 8 says this, but the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, this is quite an evil list, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is a second death. Now this is talking about the final judgment. And it's saying that all these lists of people are saying unrepentant sinners, it's people who, I mean, many people have done all these things, but it's people who have done these things and never repented of it. They will not repent of it. They will not come before the Lord and admit their sin and ask for God's mercy. And they've continued to do these things all their lives, amen. They just carried on and they went to their death like this. That's what it's talking about. But listen to this. Listen to the very, this is the thing, this freaks me out. The very first group, it says, but the cowardly. Then it goes on to say the unbelieving. Well, we know the unbelieving, that that's going to be a problem, amen, and murderers and sexually immoral. We realise that there's issues, amen. But what's the first one in the list? The cowardly. Some translations say the fearful. Do you know what the root cause of worry is, is fear? The reason people worry is because they're fearful. And fear is the beginning of all this list of sins. Does that freak you out a little bit? Does that... (laughs) Hey, June, you're supposed to be freaked out, okay? (laughs) Anyway, let's go to Romans. If you're wondering about this, let's go to Romans chapter 14 (laughs) and verse 23. It's... It's, yeah, it can be problematic asking questions when you're preaching, eh? Because <laughs> you never know what people are going to say. Okay. <laughs> Romans 14. Actually, we'll read some other verses here in Romans, eh? Just while we're here in Romans, it's just because we, we've got a little bit of time left. And uh, I won't go on too long, don't worry, I think. <laughs> I'll try my best to not do that. But uh, let's just read a few verses in here because it's an interesting chapter. He's talking about food. And, you know, uh, that's another thing that happens nowadays, isn't it, is that lots of people talk about food. There's tons of talk about food, isn't there, in the media about what foods are right to eat and what foods are not right to eat and all this kind of stuff. And there's a lot of research goes into it and there's a lot of talk about it, isn't there? But anyway, Paul says this in Romans 14. Receive one who is weak in the faith, but not to dispute over doubtful things. So he's talking about, when he says doubtful things, he's talking about kind of grey areas. You know, there's some things that are not particularly covered by the Word of God. You know, some things in life that if you went to the Bible, it won't tell you exactly one way or the other, you know, what you should do. Amen. So there's some things we just have to make decisions over, amen, that are not necessarily covered by the Word of God. Anyway, and there's some things that are just not a huge big deal either. There are some things that if you're a Christian, that if you did it, it'd be okay. And if you didn't do it, it'd be okay. Amen. I know there's some basic stuff that we just shouldn't do. I know there's some basic stuff that we should do. I mean, I understand that. But there's also some stuff that it probably wouldn't really matter too much one way or the other. Amen. And some people get very concerned over very minor things. Amen. In Christianity that are really not such a big deal. So we should really make a bigger deal out of the really important things, shouldn't we? Like whether people are saved or not and things like that. That's the really, that's the biggest one of the lot, amen. That's worth making a big deal over, amen. Does a person really know Jesus or not, amen? 
and, and not worry about some, some of the more minor things and minor doctrines and stuff like that. It's not such a much, so much of a big deal, amen? He says, for one believes he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. I don't know how many people here are eat only vegetables. I remember my son did it for a while. He just ate only vegetables for a time. He was a vegan for a time. And uh, even, even Judah and his dad tried it for a while, eh, for a short time. And... Uh, I don't know how it was for them. I've never really tried doing it. Daniel did a vegetable fast, you know, in the book of Daniel. They call it a Daniel fast when you have a fast where you just eat vegetables. It's probably quite a nice, healthy thing to do. But anyway, it says some of these people are eating. He's talking about meat. And he says some people are eating meat and some people are not eating meat. He says, let, him who eats desp- let not him who eats despise him who does not eat and let not him who does not eat judge him who eats. So he's saying either way, God receives the person. Amen. He's saying some people say, oh, we're just going to eat meat. And other people say, oh, we're not going to eat meat. We're just going to have vegetables. See, they had doctrines in those days about food and stuff. And that's what he's talking about. He's also talking about some people got really worried if you ate food that was offered to an idol. You ever been to a take? Probably most of you have eaten food offered to an idol in some sense or another. If you've been to a takeaways and you look at the back of the takeaways and there's an idol there and it's got offerings around it and everything, stuff and everything, well, pretty much that takeaways is devoted, amen, to that God. Amen. So, <laughs> so, you know, you may well have eaten food that was offered to idols, amen, or in some way was, you know, devoted or consecrated towards idols and not to Jesus, amen. But, you know, when you give thanks for it, it then becomes consecrated to God, amen. But anyway, Paul has big discussions about this because people got very worried about it. Should we eat food that's offered to idols? Should we not? Because they're saying, you know, when they go to the marketplace, some of the things have been devoted to idols, some are heaven and blah, 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 blah. And on it goes. If you want to study all that, you go and study it. Amen. And good on you. God bless you. (laughs) Amen. And it says, who are you to judge another servant to his own master? He stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand for God is able to make him stand. So this is very positive. Everything Paul says about this, either way, whatever you're doing, he's saying it's very positive. He's saying some people just choose to do this and some people just choose to do that. And he says, it's all okay. (laughs) Amen. Hallelujah. He says, even one day esteems one day, one person esteems one day above another in verse five, another esteems every day alike. So some people say, oh, this day is very holy to me. And another person is just every day is holy or every day is, you know, whatever it is. And he says, it's all okay. It's interesting. You know, Paul understands a lot about grace. One thing the Lord has been teaching me over the past months is about grace. You know, I, was, I didn't realise it, but I was such a legal creature. I was so caught up still in laws and stuff, and the world's been really releasing me from it. Anyway, we could jump to verse 14, and he says, I know and am convinced by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself. He's talking about food again. But to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it's unclean. That's interesting, isn't it? So I go to my KFC. I know this is not essentially about worry just at the moment, but I'm just taking a little bit of a digression while we're in this chapter, amen, and we'll get back to worry again. But I go to, my, but maybe some of you too worried about what you eat. I don't know. But anyway, it's up to you. But I go to my KFC, amen, I'm going to eat my KFC. Now, some people will look at that KFC, amen, and they will look at it and they will go, that is an evil, evil food. Sometimes my son tells me this. I go to eat some KFC and my younger son, says, my older son loves it. He will eat KFC every day if you gave it to him probably. But my younger son looks at it and he says, that stuff, Dad, that's terrible. That's murder. It's evil. It kills people. And he's like that. And, you know, honestly, you, you think that you needed to do some, you know, uh, some ritual or something over the KFC because it's such evil, evil food. And uh, so he's like that. And and I'm like, yeah, whatever, man. (laughs) And I'm like, (laughs) so he's like, that's evil, that's evil. I'm like, thank you, Lord, (laughs) like that. Amen. So one person sees it as a terrible thing. And another person says, me, amen, says, oh, all foods have been declared clean. I'm not worried about it. I don't eat it every day. Honestly, if you ate it every day, it'd be a bit silly, wouldn't it? I mean, that would be not sensible, amen. But sometimes I eat it, right? And so I I won't tell you how often because I don't want to tell you because I don't want you to know. But but anyway. (laughs) But to me, I look at it and I just thank God for it, amen. And I look and I say, well, you know, some people in some countries can't even get this food. 
If they got this KFC like I've got now, they would be like, yeah, baby. Just because they got some KFC, I mean, there's some people that just don't even ever get that kind of food. There's people that don't have a diet as rich and as amazing as that, I mean. So, you know, I just, when I eat it, I just thank God for it. And I say, Lord, I thank you that you take care of me and you look after me in a way. And I eat it in faith. Amen. I eat it in faith. If I looked at it, if I really listened to my younger son and I ate it and all the time I was eating and thinking, oh, there's a lot of, you know, fat in this and stuff. And oh dear, oh dear, this is terribly unhealthy. And I'm like, well, then I'd be eating in unbelief. I'd be e- I wouldn't be eating in faith, would I? I'd be like, oh, the, and that food would become be like a condemnation to me. But I don't eat it like that, amen. I just eat it in faith and I'm happy and I'm worry free, amen. See, we got the worry in there somewhere. Then he says in verse 17, for the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, amen. So he's saying, look, the kingdom of God is not about eating and drinking, okay. Can we just all say that together? The kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, amen. But what? Righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Who here wants righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit? Amen. Don't we all want that? Amen. So don't worry too much about the eating and the drinking, all that kind of stuff and everything. But concentrate on the righteousness and the peace and the joy in the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You're going to die one day anyway. And if you die with a piece of KFC in your hand, then you'll die with a smile on your face. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. So verse 21. <laughs> oh, man, I'm enjoying this. It is good neither to eat meat nor drink wine nor do anything which, by which your brother stumbles or is fended or is made weak. So Paul does actually show some concern for other people in this thing. So he says, if the things you're doing actually are going to cause someone else to stumble, so for instance, then he said, you really need to think about this. So he said, so what he's really saying is, for instance, you know, uh, uh, I, I actually don't drink alcohol. I gave up drinking alcohol years ago because I just found it's much easier and simpler for my life and I just prefer it, amen? Now, the Bible says you, it doesn't say you can't drink alcohol. It says you can. It says don't get drunk, but you can drink alcohol, amen? But don't get drunk, amen? So the problem for me is if I drink it, I get drunk. I'll start and I don't stop, amen? So it's better for me to, I don't drink it, right? Now, the thing is, let's say I did drink it, let's say I drink alcohol, but I meet another person, another believer, who does not touch alcohol, amen? For instance, like David, for instance, David, is it all right to say this, David, that's part of your testimony, yeah. David had a real problem with drinking, and thank God, he's got a great testimony, and the Lord saved him out of it, you know, late last year, as many of you know, and so, man, so it's coming up about a year now, isn't it? It's amazing. And, and so the Lord really released him from that, from that problem. Now, if somebody came to David and said, oh, David, don't, why are you worried about that for? Just drink, man. I'm a Christian and I drink. Just come and have a drink, brother. Come to the bar with me and we'll go and just get totally, you know, juiced up at the bar or whatever and all this kind of thing and see this. That would not be a good idea, would it? To come to die, I don't think he'd listen anyway. But if it's not a good idea, if, if that's going to be a stumbling block for that person, you wouldn't do that, would you? Amen? I actually made that mistake many years ago my, with, my, with my wife's dad. You know, he really shouldn't have been drinking. He had a bad liver. And, uh, and, and sometimes I was having, a, this was back when I did used to drink, I was having a beer and things and stuff at the house where he was. And, and my wife told me off one day, and she was right. She said, you know, really, that's not a good idea because you're going to encourage my dad to feel like having a drink. And I realised, yeah, you're right. It wasn't a good idea. So sometimes you've got to think about other people, amen? Hallelujah. So if somebody decides, you know, that it's their personal consecration to God, they don't want to eat pork, for instance, well, it's probably not a good idea to, you know, cook bacon when they come over to the house, amen, and you're sitting there eating your bacon and going, gung, 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 like this on your bacon, and they're sitting there, they, they don't eat pork, amen. It's probably just not going to help them too much. So he's talking about those sort of things and having some consideration. And then he says, verse 22, do you have faith? Have it to yourself before God. Happy, say happy. happy. <laughs> amen. Happy is he who does not condemn himself and what he approves. Do you know it's one of the most amazing verses in the Bible? Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves. 
Now, we're not saying that you approve yourself to go and, amen, to do murders and stuff like that, amen. But there's some areas that are not strictly, you understand me, that are not strictly that the word says you can't do it or you can do it or whatever. There's some things where you make a personal choice, amen. And he says, happy is he who does not condemn himself and what he approves. So even if somebody else comes to you and says, oh, you know, for instance, like my younger son says to me, oh, that KFC is evil. But I eat the KFC and I just say, happy is he who does not condemn himself by what he approves. Amen. And I'm happy about it. I'm happy as. Amen. I made a joke on Facebook earlier in the week. Some people think I'm serious. You know, if you read something from me on Facebook, please realise that many times I'm joking, all right? Some people take me seriously. Many times I'm joking, so never take me too seriously. Sometimes I put something serious on there and you can say, yes, that's serious or something. But some people, I think, don't know quite whether I'm joking or not sometimes. But anyway, uh, I put uh, something on there earlier this week and people were telling me go for a run. It was something about my weight and something. I say, go for a run and go to the gym and all that kind of stuff and everything. Well, happy is he who doesn't care about the gym. Amen. If you want to go to the gym, then praise God. Hallelujah and good. I admire and respect people that go to the gym and I think that's good. Amen. I really do admire their commitment and to their looking after their, you know, fitness and all that kind of thing and everything. But for me personally, I don't even worry about it. I don't, I just, I just don't care that much. Amen. And, you know, I believe in getting exercise and all that kind of stuff, but I'm just not one of those people that's like, hey, we're going to go to the gym. I've watched all my family join the gym and all that kind of stuff. And then after however many months it was and everything, they stopped going and had to cancel all their subscriptions. <laughs> but anyway, verse 23, listen to this. But he who doubts is condemned if he eats because he does not eat from faith. But listen to this. This is the important thing. Now, remember in the book of Revelation, at the beginning of that list, it said the cowardly, amen, the fearful. It says, for whatever is not from faith is sin. Whatever you do that's not of faith is sin, amen. And listen, fear and then it's resultant things like worry and stress and anxiety are not of faith, are they? Fear and faith are actually opposites, the Bible teaches. We don't have to go, time to go into that, but fear is actually the opposite to faith. So if you're in fear, you need to get out of fear, amen, so that you can get into faith. If you're in fear, you're not in faith, amen? Sometimes I hear people and they're trying to have faith, but they're in fear. And, I, and, and I'm thinking to myself, please, you know, give up the fear and just get into faith. Amen. Because faith is so much more fun and so much better and so much more of an adventure than being in fear. So whatever is not from faith is sin. Just let that, just, just for a few moments, just let that sink in for a moment. Anything in your life that you do that's not of faith is sin. You need to, your, your life must be, you know why this is so important? I was thinking about this during the week. God bases every, all his blessings on faith. We must have faith to receive blessings from God. There's no way around that. Amen? There might be the occasional time where God just does something for someone and they had no faith whatsoever. That happens sometimes. But generally speaking, God bases his blessings on faith. You must have faith. Amen. Hallelujah. Did I get into that last 15 minutes, Mon? That, uh, that mode of the last 15 minutes? <laughs> Not yet. I'll stop before I get in there. I heard about this last 15 minutes part of the sermon where sometimes I start to, some, I don't know, I do something, go into the twilight zone or something. So I try not to go there. But whatever is not of faith, amen, is sin. So eat in faith, drink in faith. Do not worry about anything, amen. Worry is not faith. Worry and faith can't live together. Do you understand that? If you're going to have faith, you can't have worry. So just, let's stand up together. We just, we just do something in this area, amen. We just make a commitment to the Lord in this area. And we just speak to you right now, Lord. Lord, we're just going to make a declaration of faith to you. And we're just going to make some adjustments before you, Lord, right now. And so, Lord, we come to you. And if you just say after me, just say, I repent of fear. I repent of worry. I repent of stress. 
I repent of anxiety. Lord, I ask you to help me. And I cast all my cares, all my worries, all the burdens over onto you. And Lord, right now, I get myself into faith. I believe you. I believe your word. I believe your promises. I believe what you've spoken to me. And Lord, I come to you right now and I leave fear behind and worry behind. Lord, you said, do not worry, not once, not twice, but three times to me. And so, Lord, I accept that and I will not worry. I make a faith decision right now not to worry about anything ever again. In Jesus' name, name. amen. Amen. Hallelujah. And you just got to stick to that. If you begin to wander off into worry and anxiety and fear again, just catch yourself and give yourself a little talk, amen, and a little, (laughs) amen, and just say, hey, just stop it. Get out of the fear and the anxiety and the worry and into faith, amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, just have, let's have a bit of fellowship and nice cup of tea and things, and God bless.